All right. Thank you for coming. This is uh, So You Got Your Stuff Info, Sec Manager Job. Now what? I am John Woods. I have letters by my name. I'm on the internet. I work for a company called Novacost as a security consultant. Feel free to talk to me about what I do, what my company does, or anything else security or banjo related after the talk or online. Before I joined Novacost, I ran a security engineer team for five years. It was eight people uh, for a company with over 10,000 people in it. So what I'm giving you in this talk is going to be personal life experience. It's all real. It's not theoretical. It's not based on things I've heard or books I've read. All right? This is the outline. The keeping your job part is actually the most important, so stay awake during that part or call your friends and tell them to come back and listen to that part or skip ahead if you're watching online. All right. The first thing I want to talk about is whether you should say technical or not. If you work for a company and you're a, it's a small team, you have one or two people working for you, you're the lead engineer slash manager, this really isn't a decision that you get to make. But if you work for a bigger company and you have a lot of people working for you, you're going to be very busy and it's going to be very hard to spend the time to maintain those skills. And oftentimes your leadership will encourage you not to spend time maintaining those skills. And they'll try to pretend like you don't know how to delegate if you do maintain those skills. Um, I think that's the wrong approach. I think they're giving you bad advice. It's a good idea for them if you lose those skills, but it's not good for you. Uh, your job security in this role is much less than an engineering role, and there's much less of those jobs around. You might find yourself looking for a job someday, and if you didn't maintain your skills, and by maintain I mean keep current, don't your the skills that got you the job in the first place, you might end up going from a senior engineer to a manager to a junior engineer, which is depressing. Don't let that happen to you. <laughs> so um, it also makes you a better leader if you actually can do some of the things that your employees can do. So spend the time to keep your skills current. Tr keep at least the skills that you brought to the job up to date throughout the course of having the job. You will be tempted not to. You will be very busy. But I highly recommend doing this. You'll regret it someday if you don't. All right, so assuming you're in this job, you took over from somebody who got fired or got promoted or you're the first security manager in the company and you inherited technology and people from other teams to make it. First thing you have to do is figure out what you have. This is the order of importance, I think, and we're gonna talk about each of them in detail. People are your most important asset. So if everything else is bad and you have really good people, you can make everything else better. But the reverse is also true. So if you have a great budget and mediocre people, eventually they'll get sick of giving you money and not getting anything in return for it. So focus on your people. The most important part of your people is how technical they are. You want to build a team with all super geeky engineers. And if you're encouraged to just kind of settle on employees, that's bad advice. That might be great advice for another team, you might be able to get away with some resources and some workhorses if you're a DBA team, but not a security team. So hold out, go after the really superstar technical engineers, which means you have to do a good job tech screening, which a lot of people screw up. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. First off, everyone uses the same questions that they get off the internet, and you might be using them and not know it because you picked it up from somebody else where you just came to the natural conclusion this is a good question because they are good questions. Problem is, everyone uses these. All security engineers have been in two or more interviews to figure that out. They've Googled it, they read it. So Google security engineer interview questions. It's the second link typically. It's a great list of questions with good answers. And since so many people doing tax screenings out there don't know the answers to the questions, they use these because they're given the answers. So if you ask people, how does traceroute work? What's cross-site scripting? What's cross-site request forgery? Where do you get your security news from? Et cetera, et cetera. You don't know anything about that person yet because they just read the answers to those on the website. The other thing is phone screening for a technical side you're just testing how good they can use Wikipedia. So you have to do a good text screen in person and question answer text screens. You're going to get tricked. You're going to get gamed occasionally. They just have to give you good stories that their coworker told them about in their last job. So, and very few people actually do anything more than that. So 
go one step further. If they're supposed to be able to, for example, review firewall rule changes and go, should I approve this or not? Hand them five or six pieces of paper that are firewall rule requests. Some are good and some are bad. Have them tell you which ones are good and which ones are bad and why. If they can't do that, don't hire them. If uh, they're supposed to have some offensive skills, they should be able to hack into a website and sit them in front of a computer with two VMs. One's got damn vulnerable web app, one's got backtrack. You should be able to knock two of these out in a few minutes and show me how to do it. If they can't do it, well, don't hire them to be your web penetration guy. Right? So very few people do that. It doesn't take that much time and energy to set it up, to figure out what that is, especially if it's just print out paper, have them whiteboard an idea, have them explain things. Do more than just question and answer. Don't just accept their stories. Obviously look for people with uh, different strengths. Don't hire all network security people and expect to be able to then just cross train. You know, look for different kinds of skills. What those are going to be are going to depend on your environment, obviously. But two skills you should always have on a team like this, on a security engineer team that you're either part or completely responsible for organization's IT security, is you need a good coder. By coding, I mean you know, Ruby, Python, Perl. If you don't have that, build it or hire it. If you don't know why you need that, it's because you don't have it. So everything that you own most likely has some kind of API or some way in some automated fashion to interface with. And it's amazing how much stuff you can get to work way better and how much you can meet your business needs with the products you purchase or how already inherited if you have this skill. It just, you really, really need this skill. You also need somebody that knows a little bit of offensive, even if you're a defensive team. You make better decisions on where to focus, and it's really powerful to be able to demonstrate yourself. This is why this is a bad idea. This is what people can do with it. And even if you pay somebody else to do all your pen tests, and you do annual pen tests every year, you should be finding the, the easy stuff to get the value on that pen test. If a pen tester shows up, does an NMAP scan, imports that into Metasploit, he does a freaking Hail Mary tech with Armitage and they own you, you failed. You should do that yourself. That's easy stuff. And if you don't have at least one person on your team that can do that, you're not getting the benefit out of, out of those engagements that you should. You really need to encourage a super uber geeky culture in your team. This should be your team's culture. Everyone should be excited about being the security engineer. Everyone should want to backtrack VM. Everyone should want to learn what else other people are doing on the team. You, you need to figure out ways to make that fun. I literally did hacking contests when I was, was in this role. We did, had people do classes and then at the end of the class do a contest. So I did that with forensics, had one forensics person. So we did forensics lab, lab basically and then there's a contest, you know, here's a hard drive, you have two hours of the hard drive, here are the things that you can find, right? It was fun, people enjoyed it. If you have someone in your team that has, doesn't want to have anything to do with cross-training, doesn't want to learn new skills, doesn't want to get involved in any of this fun stuff, they're just, I do firewalls and that's all I ever want to do, seriously consider replacing them with somebody that's actually exciting and about security and wants to do other things because odds are somebody excited about security, you can probably learn everything that person knows pretty quickly. So you don't really need somebody who's given up. Now, like I said, you inherited something if you're in this role. So either the team pre-existed or it's a new team, but as part of building a new team, you get stuff from other teams. So the network team gives you the firewalls, maybe Windows team gives you AV, etc. You're going to be told a lot of things about what this technology does and doesn't do, what, what's good about it, what's bad about it. Don't believe any of it and don't repeat any of it until you see it for yourself. So either you are checking out with your, yourself personally, if you trust your skills in that technology, where you get somebody who you trust their skills and wasn't the one who implemented it to look over it. Because that's the only way you're not going to get blamed for it when you figure out it doesn't actually do any of the stuff that people told you that it does. And you will find some of that. So if you inherited a WAF, after you get a chance to look at it, you'll figure out, eh, SQL injection to turn off on that WAF. 
or the vulnerability scanning program people talked about was so good. Yeah, a year ago, all the authentication broke on it. And the patching really isn't that good. It's just no longer an authenticated scan. You'll find these little things that people think work, and they don't. And if you were repeating what they said, you said, oh, yeah, we do that. And then once you figure out you don't, then they're going to blame you for it. Instead, be like, well, you say that you do that. I haven't had a chance to look at it myself. Let me get one of my engineers to figure this out. And then you can go, well, actually, yeah, I inherited this, this, and this. So don't take ownership of technology until you have a chance to really look at it. Things have a tendency to go bad over time, and people don't know. Based on that, in this role, if you're, you're going to be either buying and picking a lot of technologies. And so I want to talk about best of breed versus sweet for a little bit. And the reason is, because I think I have some hindsight on this, because I went best of breed. <laughs> And best of breed seems really good academically. That is my favorite graphic, by the way. <laughs> so I really thought it was a good idea. I thought I'll get the best products for everything, time all together with this awesome sim, I'll be the most secure. But I'd never been a manager in a big company before. I didn't understand how the game was played at large companies. So if you work for a large company, there's a whole process that you have to follow to buy a new product, um, especially if it's a new vendor, right? And it can take months. I'm mean, talking like six months, eight months. And it's specifically designed to make sure you do not get the best product. Its goal is to make sure that you follow the consistent path and that everything was evaluated the same so that whoever loses can't claim that you did something inappropriate, right? So you're almost guaranteed not to get the best product. So what a very common example is you have an RFP process, here's a template, you have to score all these pay, all these RFP responses, three quarters of which are part of the template, and you don't even care what the answer is, but they have equal weight in the score. And then you have 10 different people, and then you merge all those numeric answers together to come up with the best one, and that's the one you buy. But almost no one in the process actually agrees that that one was actually the best one. Right? Because it's not a scientific process. There's no science there. They act like those numbers are scientific, but they're not. But it's a consistent process. And so the losers can't sue you. The losers can't say, well, you bought that one because your brother works for that far. Because you have documented evidence. Right? And that's the point of it. And you can't get around it. So before you go this path, I highly recommend talking to your peers, other managers that have been there for a while, and find out what the process is and how painful it is and how long it takes. Because if you have to do something like that, it's not necessarily it's going to be as awesome as you think it's going to be. If it's a small company, you don't have that, you have freedom, well, heck yeah, go best of breed, man, that's awesome. But if, if you have to follow someone else's process, it's not necessarily going to be best of breed. You're just deciding, I don't want to work with a sweet vendor you're not necessarily getting the best thing. You can avoid a lot of that pain if you go sweet, because you can just convince people, if this company sells something and I need it, that's the one I'm going to buy, and I'm not going to go through that huge process. I'm not going to, me and my security engineers aren't going to spend three months, six months, eight months, figuring out what it is that we should buy and scoring things. We're going with them. And nine times out of 10, if they don't have something that I need, I'll just call them up and say, who do you partner with? And there'll be one company, and that's the one we'll buy. And we still don't go through the process. The downside of this is you know up front you're not necessarily getting the best stuff. Some of the stuff's going to be the best, and some of it's not. That's kind of a painful pill to swallow up front. But in hindsight, it's what you get with the other side, too. So it's, you know, it's an interesting choice. Neither is right or wrong. It's really going to depend on your environment, the size of the company, the red tape that they put around things. But it's something to consider. It's not something that I understood really well when I took over the job. And in hindsight, the huge amount of effort, my, not only myself, but my security engineers put in product selection, might have been better served making products work. And we might have done a better job if we just said, you know, we're just going to go with this big company that sells all this stuff. If I worked for a smaller company that didn't have any of that red tape, and I just had 
the ability to pick what I wanted. I'd probably still go on that path though. So it's really, it depends on you, depends on the company and the processes. Just something to consider. If you inherited a suite, by the way, don't just stick with it because that's what you inherited. Look at it. Some of these partners are better than others. There's some really good ones. There's some really not so good ones. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> but don't just go with it because that's what you inherited. Or the first product you need out of the gate, they're actually really good at it. Look at the whole suite. Look at everything they offer. If they offer things that you're going to buy and it's not so good, and they're not known for that, get the roadmap for that. Make sure that they're actually planning on approving it and it's not just a side product that's fleshing out their suite and they're never going to do anything with it. You know? So up front, when you first start, is pretty much your only chance to actually switch suite partners if you really want to. If you go down, if you get in bed with them for a couple of years, it's going to be really hard to switch. So hindsight is kind of painful in that case. If anyone has any questions or wants to comment, just stop me. We'll have time at the end too, but what the hell, it's a security conference. All right. Leadership. Social engineering works, by the way. Everyone successful does it. Learn a little bit about it. Anyone who approves your policies or approves your budget, just make sure they like you as a human being. You know, I'm not saying make sure that they understand everything there is about security, but if they close their eyes and picture you, they should smile. All right? It just makes everything else easier. Once you get that down, figure out what they know about security and what their opinion is on it. If it's good and they like you, well, awesome. Your job's going to be easy. That's awesome. If they don't, which is actually pretty common, you're going to have to work on that. But that might take years because you can't just, like, educate them. If you come across preachy or like I know more about something than you, that normally doesn't work out so well with directors and senior directors. So you're going to have to let them come to conclusions on their own. In the meantime, you'll have to get things done. And you'll have to get things done to help them understand that security is actually valuable. What you want to do in that case is find out what does make them tick. Find out what they do understand. Everyone senior in IT has metrics that they watch monthly or quarterly and they measure themselves on it, they measure their leaders on it, and they use it to figure out, you know, how things are going. There's probably a security one on there, there might not be, if there isn't, that's something you'll be able to fix. If there is, it's probably garbage, it's probably something like percentage of desktops that have valid AV signatures on them. Nothing all that useful. So and that's not going to help you sell like a border security project, for example. So say your border security needs some work and no one really gets it and no one wants to fund it. Find out what they pay attention to. Maybe one of the statistics that they watch, maybe one of the top 10 statistics that they watch is percentage of uptime of customer-facing websites. It's actually kind of a common one if you have customer-facing websites. Perfect. Dig into that. Find out who keeps that statistic. Find out who measures it. Get the data on it. If you're lucky, there will be a couple of instances in the last couple of years of DOS attack, outage, or some other security event outage. And then you have a case. Then you can say, well, based on my research, I think these attacks are going to increase over time. And this statistic's at risk. If I don't do this project to lock some of these things down, and get some DOS protection and oh yeah, this other protection that we need too that you don't care about, but it all comes in the same products and so yay, you gotta get funded. Or your statistics gonna go yellow and that's one tenth of your bonus and you don't want that to go yellow. That's how you get funded. Eventually you'll get them to have real security metrics. We'll talk about that later. But up front, that can be very effective if you can make the right tie-ins. That one's an easy one. Sometimes you have to get really creative. So Odds are, if you just took over a team, pretty soon after you took over a team, you'll realize that nothing's ever been written down, ever. Just almost 100% guaranteed, unless you work for very specific industries. So don't freak out about it. If you do freak out about it, and you call everyone there and go, hey, we've got to write all this stuff down, you'll literally get eye rolling and moaning, groaning, and, and literally just like, oh, God, no, I don't want to write that down. 
And for new employees to do that to their boss is like serious. That means they really seriously don't want to write that down because you're the fourth new boss to come in and say, holy crap, we can write everything down. They know they're never going to read it. They know none of their peers are ever going to read it. The person who writes it is never going to reference it. And the people, other people on the team are never going to read it. They're just going to call the guy who wrote it. And if they can't get a hold of them, they'll just suffer through it because they'll forget that you wrote it in the first place. So instead, don't be that guy. Instead, what you want to do is just pull them together and say, okay, someday something bad's going to happen. And it's going to be made worse because we didn't know something. Because whoever's on call or whoever's available just didn't have some piece of information. And it was worse. It was a longer outage where the breach was worse or we couldn't give the executive some piece of nugget information that would make them feel better, whatever. Let's figure out what all those things are. Get those written down. Get those someplace where we can find them easily and keep them up to date. Wiki, SharePoint site, if your company is in SharePoint, just a folder share that's formatted in a way that you can find stuff. And then move on. Because if you don't, when that bad thing happens and then it comes out that, well, this was outage was twice as long as it should have been because the security team didn't know what they were doing, you will be made to document everything. And it will be painful and it won't be your decision anymore. So that's a much better approach. Let everything else slide. There's plenty to do. Trust me, there's plenty to do. All right. Holy crap. I'm talking fast. This took way longer in practice. I might be nervous. <laughs> All right. This is extra important for engineers who want to be managers. It's really important for managers too, but pay extra attention to this if you ever want to this job someday and you work for this person. Now, the top bullet here, that's the one I came up with. Every company's org structure is a little different. It might be named different. There might be one of these might be missing. There might be a couple extra ones in your organization. But this is a pretty general good list of not just teams, but specifically the leaders of those teams that are very important to you. If the leaders of those teams hate you, you're going to get fired. It might take two years, but you will get fired eventually because people hate conflict at the manager level. It is a country club. You can get blackballed. You can get kicked back to the public course. Welcome to management. All right? So if their entire team hates you, the manager's going to hate you because you're making their job more difficult. All right? So the flip side is, is if they fight for something for you, if they're really going after, like, man, we really need X, you know, where my entire architecture diagrams don't work anymore, if you don't give this guy over here this thing, well, you're probably going to get it. So they can also really help you. If you're a security engineer trying to become a manager and these people don't like you, you're probably not going to get that promotion. If you do get the promotion, well, now you're going to get fired because these people hate you. So that kind of sucks. So if these people like you, make sure they stay liking you, right? If you screwed up this relationship, any of these ones, so if you screwed up multiple of the relationships, you're kind of in trouble already. There's not much I can do for you. If you screw one of them up, Focus on fixing it like it's one of your highest priorities and never give up. Talk to your boss about it. Make sure your boss knows about it. Go to your boss and say, hey, the head of audit hates me. I might have called her ugly in the meeting. I don't know, but she hates me and I need to fix it. Get advice on how to fix it. Make sure that that person knows what's going on. Schedule a meeting with the whoever it is doesn't like you, tell them how sorry you are for whatever the heck it is that you did and that you feel bad about it and you want to fix it and fall on your sword for them. It may or may not work. If it works, great. Don't screw the relationship up again. You'll never fix it a second time. If it doesn't work, keep at it and just keep doing it. Keep trying to fix the relationship and make sure your boss knows that you're still trying to do it, even if it's obvious that it's never going to work, even if you hate the person. And you don't want to be friends with the person. Just keep doing it. Because someday, a senior leader, maybe two levels above you, is going to get sick of hearing about the fact that these two people don't work well together. And they're going to decide to fire one of you. 
It's just going to happen. And if you worked nonstop for a year trying to make the relationship good and that person just kept screwing you and your boss knows about it, maybe they'll decide to fire that person instead of you because you made them look like the jerk and the unprofessional one. Right? Maybe. It's not a guarantee. <laughs> so, but it's your only shot, to be honest, if you can't fix the relationship. If you, like I said, if you're an engineer, don't let these relationships sour. And it's actually easier as an engineer to fix them. They're much more willing to give you a second chance as an engineer. So fix them before you get promoted. Sir, you have a question? You know, good question. So he's basically saying, how do you, you know, basically, how do you make them happy with you by not, in essence, pacifying them, I assume, by, because you still have to do your job as a security leader and basically tell them, no, you can't do that. That's insane. You just, that's stupid, right? So, excellent question. Thank you for the question. So you have to say no to these people occasionally. And, you know, if you say no to them enough and in a way that upsets them, eventually they'll hate you and then you're done, you know? So that's where the social engineering comes in. So you basically, first and foremost, you never use the word no, ever, with them, right? Just just take that word out of your vocabulary. So they'll come to you with something completely insane. They're like, okay, look. And then they might not even come to you, they might just send you an email. They want you to click an approve button or something. And there's like, oh, look, hey, we, I want to open up 14, 13, 1433 to the SQL database directly to the internet to give our customers more access to the data and just use one generic username and password and this is great and it's going to save tons of time and they're going to love it. They're like, oh, awesome. So don't tell them no. Definitely don't shoot them down in front of other people and don't do it in an email. You go talk to them. You go talk to them private. You say, help me understand what you're trying to do here. Okay, I'm trying to get customers to access data. Great. Say, great. I'm with you. That's a good idea. I like the idea of getting customers access to data and making it easier for them. I'm behind you on that. I'm a little concerned that the approach you've chosen might not pass an audit or a pen test, and it might be outside the bounds of some of our core security policies. And ultimately, that will turn out to be bad for us because we'll have to back it out. And that will be extra bad for customers because they'll be used to it at that point. Can I help you? Can I work with you and help you figure out how to achieve those goals in a way that will pass an audit? So we can keep it open and we won't have to turn it off later. Now you're helping them, right? And you never said no. The word N-O never came out of your mouth. But you never actually let them do that crazy thing that they want to do. But you still have to be the security manager. So it is difficult. And it's a fine line. And it's especially difficult as a security engineer first joining into this role. Because your instinct is to tell them that they're completely insane. And let me school you and how computers work and how idiotic that is and they don't care and it's just going to upset them and they've been managing teams for 20 years and you're this new upstart and I'm going to get you fired or replaced with someone older I don't like you right so that's what I'm talking about that's what you have to do and you always have to do that and if you slip up once you'll be going through the process that I just explained hoping that you can fix the relationship we good Hold on, this guy's got a call. Give me a second. All right. So keep your team happy. So if you do have run into some problems, say for example, like in the previous example, maybe some people don't like you and you run into some rough, rough time. If your team is successful and they love you, it's really hard to get rid of you. I mean, they still can. It's just harder. It really gives you some coverage, and it actually gives you some leverage to be able to do some stuff from a security point of view. They can't be lazy and happy. You can't make them happy because you just don't make them work. They have to be good, they have to be doing things, and they have to really love you. So first and foremost, get them funded. So a board security team is unhappy. So you get the money and create what I, what I like to refer to as a shit umbrella and keep them out of the political realm keep them shielded from the, you know, the kinds of conversations I was just talking about because it drives most security engineers completely insane 
to be in one of those conversations, right? And give them things to do and help them see how they're pushing security forward and they're gonna be happy. You also need to hold your people accountable and you have to figure out when someone's really not making it. So remember earlier on in the talk, which should have been a half hour ago, but it was like five minutes ago, um, I talked about how the people are your most important asset. They need to be geeks. You need to create a culture of basically we are super smart computer people. If someone's not fitting into that and they're not really making it, whether you hired them or not, you know, maybe you did a bad hire, or maybe you inherited someone that's not quite really living up to what everyone else in the team is, you're going to have to eventually get them out of the team. Leaving them in the team year after year drags everything down. Um, it's painful and difficult, but you have to do it. Um, and your team will love you for it, ultimately. Right? So, and you, because if you have all good, strong, technical people that are pulling their weight, and you're getting things done, you're going to have a happy team. And, like I said, it's much harder to, it's really actually quite easy to fire a manager that someone doesn't like, and their team really isn't a big fan of them. You're just toast. You're done. You're gone at that point. This might be the most interesting one. And some people might not agree with it, and I'm cool with that. But you're protecting your board from an actual technical security thing is actually your most important thing you got to do as far as keeping your jobs concerned. And assuming you're the right person for the job, that actually makes this even more important than you would think. Yes, insider threats are real. Yes, they happen. Yes, they are more devastating when they do happen. There's all these statistics out there about insider threats. But when that happens, odds are you're not going to get fired. You know, first off, they normally, if you can figure out who did it, well then that person's getting fired. Scapegoat, right there. They don't need to fire a second person, they just need to fire the person who did it. You're also less likely to be really held accountable if a trusted insider did something bad. It's normally not seen as the most carnal sin. But if someone from the internet does something evil on your network, well that's seen as unforgivable often, and how did you possibly let that happen? And there's no one else to fire. You can't fire the person on the internet. So it's going to be you. Even if they say they won't fire you, they will fire you actually at the end of the incident. They'll let you manage the incident to completion and work all night and work all weekend, and then they'll fire you. And it'll happen every time. You need to protect your border like your job depends on it, because your job depends on it. So defense in depth, do good vulnerability scanning, scan every IP that could possibly respond not the ones you know should respond. So you catch the things that just pop up outside of the normal processes. Do good pen testing. And protect things as best as you can for your environment. And it's going to depend on what it is. You know, get a WAF if you need to, IPS, XML firewall. Make sure you're patching. Make sure the code's good. Literally, your job depends on that. Make sure it's hardened. Now, if you find something, say you do good vulnerability scanning, and you find a SQL injection attack, for example. Not that those are common or anything. And it's bad. You know, you can still admin hashes out of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a non-trivial SQL injection attack. OK. You go to the developers, the developer team, say, well, you got to fix this. If they won't, and you can't get leadership on your side on this, and it could be a lot of different reasons. The, we're busy. We're going to replace that site in a couple years anyway. Um, it's old, no one knows how to do it. We, uh, that site's so critical and so confusing to our developers that it's on their code freeze. We're not allowed to touch it. All right, fine. Your job still depends on it, so put a WAF there. Now, I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to fix it my way then. You don't have developer support, I'll throw a WAF in front of it. If you're told no, for whatever reason, no budget, or we don't like WAF, so WAF broke the site like before you joined the company and we're not going to let you do a WAF, or, oh, I don't know, we don't have the ability to do a full regression test of that site with a WAF and it's really critical, and so just, no, we're not going to let you alter it. Your instinct as a scary professional is to write that all down as a risk, get the most senior person humanly possible to sign off on it, and then frame that, put it on your wall, and wait, right? You think what will happen is, is when that gets a hit, then all of a sudden 
first off, you'll have to manage an incident, and then after, after that, they'll start listening to you, and then they'll, you'll get budget, and you'll be, you'll be able to fix things. What happens is after it gets hit, is they'll fire you. And the reason is, is if you find something like that, and then under no circumstances are you allowed to fix it, you're not a manager, right? Your job's to be fired when something bad happens. All right? So seriously, that is a pretty extreme example, but it's a real one. And if you work for a company that has a problem, on their, especially on their border, and they will not, under any circumstances, let you do anything to make it not a vulnerability anymore, your job's to get fired when something bad happens. Don't work there anymore. If you're here at Derbicon, or if you're watching on the internet, you're enough a member of this community and aware enough to not work at a company like this. Get out of there and tell everyone you know not to work there. Don't let any good security person work at that company. Don't let people you know be scapegoats. Because that's what you are if you're not allowed to fix it. On a side note, if something bad's happened, it doesn't have to be a breach from the internet. If maybe an audit went bad this time and it was better last time, or something else happened that you kind of predicted was going to happen and you covered your ass about it and you have all this documentation and you start letting people know about that and you start emailing it and bringing it up in meetings and your boss pulls you aside and says, yeah, don't, don't send that email anymore. Or don't talk to the auditor, don't talk to that director, don't, don't, you know, just, I'll, I'll take care of it. You're already fired, actually. They, they, they brought in Operation Scapegoat. Whatever that bad thing was, was enough that they pulled the trigger on that. You have maybe two, three weeks you're gone. So stop working and just look for a job. It's already over. <laughs> How many times uh, have you been fired? <laughs> so it's not all my personal experiences. <laughs> but I do know people that have been in this job or are in this job. So some of them are from there as well. Yes, sir. One comment and All right, so um, the comment was you agreed with me on the insider threat, not getting you fired, and the outside threat, getting you fired. And the question was um, I mentioned if you have someone not cutting it, you have to get rid of them. It's part of keeping your job, your team happy. And in the real world, that's a lot more painful. You don't, can't just go, you're fired. And once you know ways of actually assessment on that. Um, excellent question. The, I think, a good example is one of the more painful ones I had. Um, took months on end, actually. Killed my team for a little bit there to, to help me do it. Um, basically, what you can do, especially if somebody, if you inherited somebody, been there for a long time, that's when it's the worst, right? So if they're really new, the paperwork's pretty minor, typically. If they've been with the company for a decade or so, the paperwork's much more extreme. And also it's gonna depend, it's gonna scale with the size of the organization as well. What, one, your job descriptions for your engineers have to be solid and have to be real. So if you inherited garbage job descriptions, fix them. And that's gonna be a process by itself, but fix those. So once you have those fixed, then you rate that person based on the real job description and show all the areas that they can't actually fill the job. And you give them a performance improvement plan, can up to three months, depends on HR. HR will actually tell you how long you have to give them and improve the, the plan to be able to, to demonstrate that they can actually do the job or not. And then, as part of that plan, what, what I did is I actually did some of the things like the hacking contest, like the contest after training, to demonstrate that everybody else on the team can do something, and then this person actually can't. Because then it, it's fair, because everyone on the team is actually doing it. So we did like, um, you know, you know, class, a forensics class, a uh, web app pen test class, within a contest afterwards. Here's a vulnerable website, basically, that you log into with your ID, 
and there's 12 things that you can get. There's 12 basically contests in essence, and go through and get them. You know, and one person didn't get any of them, and everyone else got all but one of them, right? And so, and then that's data points for a performance plan that you can use to then say, okay, and maybe it's the role changed, but you know, as a corporate in um, corporate America anyway, roles are allowed to change, and if you can't adjust quickly enough, well then that's grounds for termination. Also, if they're qualified to do something else in the company, get them on another team. You don't always have to fire people. So um, if they're a really good <coughs> Windows admin and they're just not cutting it on your team, try to get them on the Windows team. Right? You end up with an ally over there anyway, and it's just it's better for everybody. So and then there's a lot less paperwork involved if you can just sneak them onto another team. So, but only if they're going to be successful. The other team don't screw your peer because it's not going to help you. <laughs> not as a manager of engineers. That's more of a senior manager director technique. Uh, he said, um, "Could you just get him promoted?" So, yeah. Good. All right. So, taking to the next level. So, let's assume. You assess the situation, you have your people and technology under control, people don't hate you, your team is happy, and your border is protected. So now you're going to be there for a while. Now what the hell do you do? Remember earlier I talked about don't say no to people? Beat that into your team's head. First off, it will help any of them that wants your job someday, right? To my point earlier. Second off, if you make your team enablers, if you tell them don't ever tell people no, they can't do it, you know, instead say, well, how, let, let, me, let me help you do that in a secure way that's actually going to pass an audit that we can approve, that kind of thing. If you change that vocabulary and change their attitude, it will go a long way in helping not only your team, but also, go back to the point earlier, it will actually help you ultimately because then that team is not going to hate your team. And if their team hates your team, well, then that boss is ultimately going to hate you because you're making their job difficult. So. If you follow my advice on the people part, you're going to have some of the geekiest people in the company, right? Occasionally, there's going to be a really hard problem in production. It has nothing to do with security. Let your team help them figure it out, right? It, it gets you a lot of bonus points with your peers, which can be helpful, right? And it, a lot of times, it can actually be good training from a security point of view. But an example is, a lot of the harder problems are performance issue in the production environment that you can't reproduce anywhere else, right? Those happen all the time. They're the biggest pain in the butt. The easiest way to pinpoint where you should look is to take back your captures from certain key ports of the network, look at Wireshark, know what you're looking at in Wireshark, and be able to figure out where the delays come from and narrow it down. Very few teams across your infrastructure department will know how to do that, right? Let, let your security engineers do that. It's excellent training from, from a security point of view, right? It's actually a cool thing to do. And if they don't know how to get to those packet captures from key points and things like that, well then, great. They need to know how to do that anyway. What happens if you really have an incident, right? So, let, lend out their expertise occasionally, right? It goes a long way. So, I said this earlier, but Get your team funded is a big deal. It's, it's one of your bigger part of your jobs, basically, as a security manager. The first year, if you're not on top of it, here's what's going to happen. Your boss is going to come to you on a Tuesday around 3 and say, yeah, the first draft of the budget for next year is due Friday. Which means I need to get to my boss Thursday, which means I need all my managers to get me their draft budgets tomorrow. I mean to tell you all week, sorry it's almost the end of the day Tuesday. Just give me something before 9 a.m. tomorrow. Don't worry, it's the first draft. But that's going to be your only input into the budget that year, and all your stuff's going to get cut. So don't let that happen. In January, assuming you're on the you know, annual fiscal calendar, find out when in general, and your boss might not tell you, so ask your peers, what month is the budget normally done for next year? It's way earlier than you anticipate. A lot of times it's July, right, which is crazy because you don't even know what you're going to finish yet for this year, but whatever corporate America is what it is. So if it's in July, in June, your team meetings with your engineers should all be about next year's budget and the roadmap. What are we really going to likely accomplish this year? What are we going to do next year? What do we want to buy? Call up the VARs, get real quotes for things. 
justify it, come up with a plan, is to have it sitting there. So that Tuesday afternoon, he's like, yeah, I need your stuff in like an hour. You have it. Here you go. You'll, you'll actually get a project or two. If, if you start with a really small budget, build successes with free things, and if you build successes with free things, towards the end of the year, have some kind of like shovel-ready projects ready to go that you can accomplish pretty quickly because a lot of teams won't spend the money that they actually allotted for themselves. And become known as the team that if you have money left over, you should go talk to the security team because they'll actually make use of it. The amount of money I got from other teams not spending their money in the third and fourth quarter of the year was more money than I ever got up front for five years because I got known as somebody who actually will accomplish something with the money you give them. But I couldn't get the really senior big books to actually prove most of them front. But about October, when you know there's a million dollars of server upgrades and they've only spent 200,000 and it becomes obvious that you can't physically upgrade that many servers for the rest of the year, suddenly some of that money frees up. It's like, hey, I can, you know, I don't know, I can, I can get an IPS in a couple weeks if you just want to give me some money, you know? It, it works really well, and then you get a couple of those successes, and then the regular budget process goes a little better, too. All right, now, back to leadership. Remember I said that they either have no security metrics, or they probably have really bad ones, like percentage of AV signatures that are valid or current or whatever. Most IT leadership is very metrics-driven. So you want your metrics on their list of things they pay attention to, and you want it to mean something. So make something that's measurable, that they can measure with a number or a percentage. So here's one example. You don't have to use anything remotely like this. You can come up with whatever you want. But do something like this. Get your stuff in, on their list, right? So one thing you can do, come up with certain number of things. So let's just say there's eight things that we do, right? And here's a maturity model. And if some of those things were basically on the you know, low wind, which I'll call one. Remember, it has to be a number, for, right? Because they take numbers and make them into colors, and it works. It's just, trust me. So, and if some of these things are a one on a scale from one to five from a maturity point of view, one of them's a two, and map it out and go, okay, here's, you know, AV signature based all the way to holy crap, AV, APT production, and here's a couple points in the middle. You know, patch management to like super awesome vulnerability management. Maybe the last one is some kind of proactive protection. Whatever. You're the you're the manager. Use your engineers. Come up with what makes sense for your environment, and then you get that bubbled up to, you know, something that they can buy into. Show them the metrics. Show them the graph. Show them everything. Get them to go. Yeah, that looks good. That's where we're at. That's where we should be. I agree with you. Then you can set goals which not only are your goals, but they're their goals. They can say, okay, well, we want by the end of next year, 80% of these things to be what we call them on the mature, like, with, like maybe it's a four, right? Now you have a number, now you have a percentage, now you have something they can track. Then six months from now, you should be tracking to 80% and you're still at 40%. And that's gonna upset that manager because now all of a sudden he has something if some director, he all he has all these green things, now there's a, a yellow one. This isn't tracking right. They're gonna come to you and say, Well, why why isn't this happening? You're like, well, I need money and resources to be able to do this, right? I had projects proposed for every single one of these things to go from one to two to three, and you cut all but one of them in your budget process. So either we need to readjust the goals or you need to give me some more money, right? Maybe more headcount, maybe more consulting dollars, right? No one likes readjusting their goals. Once they set that stuff, it's pretty much set. Suddenly the pocketbook opens up a little bit. Suddenly you get some consultants. Suddenly maybe you get a headcount out of the deal. So that's what I mean by getting some statistics on their plate that actually matter to you. So they can tell, well, look, we're not, if we're not advancing security, they can tell in a way that makes sense to them, which has to be a number that they can then make a red, yellow, green, dot. It's just the way it is. All right. So that's all I had. So I love the questions so far. The questions have all been really good. Um, I also like opinions. 
you know, even if they're different than mine, this is an uh, open forum in my opinion. Everyone here is equal. So you're not helping anybody keeping anything to yourself, whether it's a question or an opinion. So we have like two whole freaking minutes, maybe five. So, so I've I'm going to go to this. So I need to keep my CSSP, so I'm going to put that in the background <laughs> while we're, we're talking. So I've seen, you know, you said about free software, you know, to help you out. But I've seen that backfire where the next year they go, well, you've got all that accomplished with free software. You don't need to buy anything else. OK, so the question was, um, Using free software can backfire because you can just say you don't need to use anything else. Um, no, 100% sure because I haven't gone to Boris's talk tomorrow. According to him, it sounds like you can just do everything for free. <laughs> um, but yeah, that can backfire sometimes. But it's all about perception setting, you know, and it's all about picking the right things. So if you really want to get like an awesome IPS, you know, spending a huge amount of time forcing Snort to do what you want it to do is probably not the right thing that you should do if you're trying to build a success and to get some budget. So it's about picking the right thing sometimes and knowing when the free version of something is actually worthwhile and to a certain degree your sales skills. Yeah, uh, in the back, I saw you first. So the question was, how do you deal with the budgetary problem of you budget $100,000 for a product because that's what it's going to cost? And they say, well, we'll give you 80 k okay. um, So, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so, so you have people saying patent. Patent is definitely a valid approach. Um, you, but you got to be careful, too, because after a couple of years, let's just assume you're going to be in this job for a while, you'll, they'll get used to you padding it. And then now you have to start padding your pad. And then once you start padding your pad, then things start getting so crazy expensive, they just start cutting it. So it's a really dangerous path to go down. Um, so a couple different other things you can do is, if you're known for actually giving decent quotes, right, it will happen less often. Um, where you can save some money sometimes is uh, throw in consulting dollars and labor costs into it and get them to cut that, training dollars, right? Throw extras in there that aren't the core and use that to get it cut, right? Um, and then the last one is beat the crap out of your bar and make them give it to you for 80, right? It's your job, right? That's why they're cutting it. They're cutting it because they want you to go pimp out there and get it for 80, and that is actually your job. You. Okay, that's another excellent question. You guys are awesome. Um, yes, I've been mostly positive. So the question was, how do you balance out egotist? Uh, no, was it hardcore geek versus egotistical ass and security geek? So security people are odd, and it's in a very interesting way because they're mostly introverted and opinionated simultaneously, which is a bizarre ass mix. Um, and if you get the wrong mix of people on your team, it can be a disaster. So the best approach really is to build, build a really good cohesive team environment. So things I did is no one had individual goals. Everyone's goal was a team goal. Even if only one person was working on a project and that project was a, to be completed successfully was a goal for the team, everyone got rated on it. And so if that person failed, everyone gets less money, right? So everyone had shared goals. Everyone was encouraged to help everyone else. Basically, you're all in this together, and you better all help each other, or you're going to make less money. <laughs> because ultimately, that's the biggest stick you have, frankly. Um, if you build a basically like a family type environment, then what happens is the same thing that happens in most functional families is that you learn the weird personality problems that everyone has and security is not the only one that has this problem, pretty much every team has this problem, and you figure out ways around it and you become completely functional with that person 
right? And then they help each other. And then when they see that person, like, screaming at a DBA like a psychopath, they, like, come over and go, hey, 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 you know, go, come, you know, he's hungry. Just don't, it's, don't worry about it. He's hungry, and I'll, let me talk to you. And they help each other with that stuff. So it's really about, and it takes extra time. The other thing with this job is it takes more than 40 hours to do this job, which is why it's hard to maintain your technical skills, because you're going to be busy not maintaining your technical skills. Um, you, bar, I did barbecues at my house with the team, take them out to beers, you take them out go-kart racing, whatever is culturally appropriate for that team in whatever region you're in or whatever they're into, you have to build a team. That's the best way around it. Sir? I'm going to go until you kick me out, by the way. Would you prepare for losing your technical skills because you're not, you know, you don't have the time now to really be technical? You have to be like this evangelist now? Uh, okay, yeah, um, so the question was about that fear of losing my technical skills. To a certain degree, I did a little bit. Um, I was able to get them back pretty quick. Um, and the fact that I'm no longer in this job, and the fact that you know I know so many people who have either um, needed to find another job quickly or suddenly decided, you know, because you're at a bigger whim of people's personal opinions and leadership changes than an engineer is. You can want to, you might just want to change jobs pretty quickly, and there's much less manager jobs out there than engineering jobs, and there's so many people who have allowed their technical skills to atrophy that that's the only job they can go after, and so they're willing to do it for less money than you because they need a freaking job. So, yes, it's a problem and it's a fear, but it's it's a downside of having this job. You have to put that time in it. If you don't, you're putting yourself and your family at risk, basically. And frankly, it makes you a better boss. If you, if you can do some of that stuff, then you're calling BS based on knowledge, not how strongly you seem to have that opinion, which is good because scary people are opinionated even if they're wrong. So you kind of need some technical skills to do this job right. Sorry, I'll get you next. What? Okay, so the question is how do you get your nerds and your team to be good salespeople like SEs? Um, I don't know if I ever did. I think there's a certain amount of diminishing returns there. I did go after the thing I talked about, which was don't say no. You know, make sure you, 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 you see yourself and make sure they see you as enablers of how to do things securely as opposed to stopping people from doing things. Can, and, and one of the key things you have to realize is that when people come and ask you, can I do this? They're really not asking permission. It comes across like they're asking permission, but they're going to do it if you say no anyway in most cases. They'll find a way around you, right? And so you really want to help them do it securely because they're really asking, will you help me do this, not can I? Um, other than that, I don't think I really did. I let them focus on, on technical skills, and that's where I was the umbrella. And if it, that was really necessary, that's where I stepped in, basically, and tried to shield them from that while they did something more interesting. That's part of keeping your team happy. And I'm done, so I'm going to go outside, and if you got anyone else to continue the conversation, I'm here. Thank you. Oh yeah? Yeah. What's your name again?